All right, so we are back into the video. Uh, I deleted some more stuff, so hopefully that works. But um, yeah, let's get back into it. In three, two, one, play. Sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. Go to thegreatcoursesplus.com today to start your free trial. Hard places often breed hard people, and Mongolia is one of the most inhospitable lands in the world. This is the story of the people who came out of the steppes and built the biggest empire in history. This is the story of Temujin and how he became Genghis Khan. Okay. So you say me high, you don't say Michael is me high. That's that's different. The history of the eastern part of the Asian steppe is shrouded in mystery, and so the early history of the Mongols is still debated. At the beginning of the 10th century, the proto-Mongolic Khitan people formed an empire called the Great Liao. The Khitans fought many wars in Korea, China and Central Asia, but by 1125 were defeated by the Chinese Jin dynasty and moved to establish a new Khitan state called Western Liao. To the north, in modern-day Mongolia, a number of nomadic tribes united in a tribal confederation called Kamag Mongol, which can be translated as Whole Mongol. One of the oh, clans wow. within the confederacy was the Borjigin, and its representatives were elected the Khans of the Union multiple times in the 12th century. Kamak Mongol was in a long-term rivalry with the Tartar Confederacy, which also nomadized in the region. This struggle weakened the Mongols, and their confederacy almost ceased to exist in the second half of the 12th century. The chief of the Borjigin clan at the time, Yesuge, was trying to reunite the tribes once again. In 1171, he arranged a marriage between his nine-year-old son, kinda, Temujin, and the daughter of the chief of a nearby <laughs> clan, Borta. I, I was say, Some maybe, sources I think claim gonna, that Yesuge um, was poisoned by the Tartars during the gonna, wedding. I, I can see Temujin him coming to Temujin attempted to assume the role of chieftain, <laughs> but he was rejected and exiled with his family. For the next six years, Temujin lived in poverty and was even enslaved on occasion. Eventually, Temujin started forming his tribe with the help of his blood brother Jamuka and the leader of the Kerate tribe, Togruk Khan. Temujin and Jamuka raided other tribes together, but eventually they had a falling out. Jamuka supported the traditional Mongolian aristocracy, while Temujin gave positions of power to capable people outside his tribe. Threatened by Temujin's rise in popularity, Jamuka attacked him in 1187 with an army of 30,000 men. Temujin's 20,000 men were decisively beaten at the Battle of Dalan Belzut. Not much is known about Temujin's life in the next 10 years, but in 1197 we see him commanding a united force of the Mongols, the Kerites, in the war against the Tatars initiated by the Jin dynasty. Temujin would avenge his father in this conflict. The leaders of the Tatar tribes were executed, while the non-aristocrats were invited to join his ranks. He delegated authority based on skill and loyalty, rather than tribal affiliation or blood. As an incentive, Temujin promised civilians and soldiers a portion of the war spoils. His new rules laid the foundations of a code of law which would eventually be developed and applied to his empire. His father's death oh, wow. influenced Temujin, and one of the laws was that hospitality was sacred. Guests and envoys should not be harmed. Temujin revolutionized the steppe world. Each victory brought more warriors to his side, and he reformed the Mongols into an army. The decimal system was implemented, and the army was divided into tens, hundreds, thousands, and ten thousands. Transfers between the units were forbidden, and if one man deserted, the other nine in his unit were put to death. 
commanders were chosen by their men, oh, except wow. for the commanders of the Ten Thousands, so-called Tumans, who were hand-picked by the Khan himself. This chain of command allowed flexibility, discipline and loyalty, and was vital to performing sophisticated maneuvers. Every able-bodied... He was taking over. Like, honestly, he was taking over the whole... He was taking over the whole... Um, region. ...man had to be a part of this structure. In 1201, a number of opposing clans called a council, Kurultai in the Mongolian language, and declared Jamuka the Khan. This sparked a five-year war between him and Temujin, and the latter managed to defeat his former blood brother at the Battle of the Thirteen Sides. That same year, Temujin assembled another council of the Mongol chiefs, who elected him as their leader, giving him the title of Genghis Khan, the leader of all. For the first time, the warring tribes united as one nomadic nation, under one banner and one authority. In 1209, the Mongols began their first invasion against the powerful Liao dynasty to the southwest. The details of this conflict are not clear, but it seems that Genghis Khan was successful in open battles, but had difficulties taking the well-fortified cities. The Mongols learned the importance of siege warfare in this campaign. Oh, wow. The surrounded cities slowly succumbed to starvation and diseases, and the Liao Emperor had to submit to Genghis Khan and become his vassal. Up until this point, the Jin dynasty underestimated the Mongols as a nuisance on their northern border, and uh, even refused a call to aid by the Liao, happening, but, but by 1211 right. they were on Be high alert. One they even what is up, BS3 TV? Uh, hopefully we can keep this video up and just keep this video going. Because this is the third time I'm starting this video back and we're only, we're like less than halfway in. So this isn't looking too good, but let's keep going with it. And yeah, play. The trademark Mongol tactic of a feigned retreat. After a short skirmish, the Mongols pretended to flee, leaving loot as they fled. The Jin defenders took the bait and left their fortifications trying to chase them down. Little did they know they were falling into a deadly trap, where thousands of them were attacked from all sides by Mongol archers. With the gates of China now open, Genghis Khan began raiding the countryside before he withdrew for the winter. The following year, the Mongols struck again, only this time they besieged Datong, where Genghis was wounded by an arrow. The city held out against the invaders, who once again retreated for the winter, this time with even more knowledge about their enemy and siege warfare. In 1213, when the Mongols invaded again, their mobility prevented the Jin from organizing a successful resistance as their countryside was raided. Oh, wow. The Mongols began besieging multiple fortresses and cities, and waited for the enemy to attempt to break the siege, only to be ambushed and defeated. The Mongols were fighting guerrilla warfare within a foreign land. The cities that surrendered had most of their inhabitants murdered or enslaved. However, engineers, artisans, merchants, doctors, teachers, priests and administrators were spared and asked to join the Mongol horde. Many others were taken and used as meat shields for the following sieges, marching in the vanguard to block arrows or discourage the archers That's from firing. Crazy. Wow, he really... He was... He After was securing all Jin like land like north his, of the Yellow River, like great, great, Genghis great moved against the capital of Beijing and besieged it. The Mongols tried to starve the city out, but after a few months an epidemic spread through their camp and they had to negotiate with the Jin Emperor Zhuangzong. He agreed to peace in exchange for a tribute of loot, men, horses I and mean, his daughter, along with subjugation to the Mongol it. Khan. Thus, the Mongols left China and returned to Mongolia with their treasure. But just outside the Great Wall, a messenger galloped to Genghis Khan. The emperor had moved his court to Kaifeng to the south. This enraged the Great Khan, as it signaled that the Jin planned to retaliate. The Mongols quickly returned to Beijing and besieged the city with the help of thousands of Chinese engineers. 
the city was surrounded, breached and razed. For weeks, thousands of carts hauled loot back to Mongolia. The fires in the city burned for over a month, while its people were massacred. Ooh. What was once considered a nuisance had brought a 20 million strong nation to its knees. And now, the Mongol devastation was heading west. While creating this documentary, we used the series of lectures. <sighs> Hold up for another minute, because I'm going to have to do a fourth recording. <laughs>